Hey, you can get some cool and fun rewards for helping me help kids. Stick around after the video for more information. Well, my editing skills are crap, but can the same thing be said about Batman, the series premiere on the CW TV network? Stick around and find out. Hey, I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. This is my uncut review of the series premiere of Batwoman on the CW. Uh, the synopsis for the pilot, at least, uh, reads on IMDb. Says, Kate Kane, armed with a passion for social justice and a flair for speaking her mind, soars onto the streets of Gotham as Batwoman, an out lesbian and highly trained street fighter primed to snuff out the failing city's criminal resurgence. But don't call her a hero yet. In a city desperate for a savior, Kate must overcome her own demons before embracing the call to be Gotham's symbol of hope. <sighs> All right. Um, so let's talk about the story script pacing, the general tone and vibe of this thing. This is, it's another CW or yeah, CW DC TV show. Um, I tuned in because I thought, you know, well, maybe, maybe this time, you know, it'll be different. It'll be something that will connect with me because I do not like any of those CW shows as much as I would really like to because they do a lot of cool fan oriented type things for fans of DC comics. But alas, uh, this did not end up being uh, anything different uh, in the, in, in the, in favor of my tastes. I have major issues with the script. They uh, like, and this is common of many of these, of these CW DC shows, but they force exposition into dialogue in uh, almost every scene rather than letting moments breathe and performances kind of carry those scenes with layered subtext provided by the actors. Um, you know, this this approach might work for those who go to fiction for story, maybe, instead of character. But I think if, if you go to this for story, you're going to probably be disappointed, too, because there were tons of story issues that didn't make sense to me. The episode opens up with Kate training in arctic waters you know like so much that the, the surface is frozen and she has to break out of it and she's not wearing a wetsuit and so to begin with the fact that she's actually able to basically just appear to be swimming normally and not reacting to the cold in the underwater scenes uh was you know already like you know head scratching to me and then when she comes out and enters into shelter with only a slight shiver indicating that she is cold i'm like what in the world am I looking at here? What is this supposed to be, you know? Uh, later, Kate puts on a mattified, a mattified, modified Batman costume. And after that is suddenly an expert at using Batman's gadgets and employing his techniques and tactics. It's, you know, it's one thing to be a good fighter and to have some fighting training. And it's another to have all of Batman's uh, rainbow of skills. She also lacks an interesting drive, an interesting motive. Batman, as a young Bruce Wayne, saw his parents murdered in front of him um, when he was a child, and that drove him to this obsession with vengeance and justice toward the criminal world. Kate's mom and sister were killed in a car accident caused by the Joker. Um, so a little bit, a little bit indirect. It wasn't exactly the Joker killing them, uh, but it was a car accident caused by the Joker, and she. Sp but but really she doesn't spend her life obsessing over the fact that the Joker killed my family Joker no she's obsessing over why Batman didn't seem to care as much about the fa the safety of her family as he did about getting the bad guy you know that was her big thing that she's just been puzzling over for years um, this misunderstanding is corrected but I have trouble seeing what would drive Kate to the same obsession that Batman has. And I think that's really important for a character that doesn't have any superpowers. Because with Batman, what makes him work is, you know, uh, yes, he is a quote-unquote normal human being. Obviously, he's not normal, you know. Uh, but he's the, the concept is that he's so driven. That's how he becomes so skilled. That's how he becomes so capable despite being a mortal human being. He is so freaking driven. 
and you can uh, kind of understand, you know, or a little bit, you know, why he would be so driven after what he experienced. And I just don't see the same kind of motivation being provided for Kate Kane. Instead, her motive is summed up in the end as being about, you know, living a life where she feels like she never fits. And now that she's found the missing Batman's old equipment, she feels like she has a place to fit uh, and play by her own rules and stuff. That's kind of a summary statement made at the end of the pilot, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, so themes of fitting in, dealing with rejection as she experiences um, several times in her life, these are powerful and relatable themes, but how does that translate to an obsession with fighting crime and becoming capable of, of doing that? Uh, she's just sorely missing a motivation that strongly and clearly connects to what she's going to be doing throughout this entire series. Uh, and it, she is all too conveniently capable uh, in terms of combat and just all of her abilities in general, all, way too conveniently capable to a degree that Bruce Wayne only achieved through years of training by the best in the world, you know? So it all just felt way too easy for Kate Kane. Uh, now talking about the uh, the performances, the, the actors a bit, the acting is... Um, it comes across to me as one-dimensional, and when it does go for subtext, because I think it's this isn't. I don't want to you know pin this on the actors too much. I don't know. I've not seen these actors in other things, so I don't have a sense of you know really what their abilities are outside of CW shows. And CW shows do not tend to be a showcase of actors' abilities, um, whether they have abilities or not. You know, uh, when they do go for subtext, which is you know not common in CW shows, at least not a, the subtle kind of subtext that I like, it comes off too strong. You know, there's like this, there's a scene, here's just one example. When a woman is with her husband, and she runs into a former lover, so the three of them are standing there and talking, and she's wincing through the entire exchange, uncomfortable talking to her former lover, and her husband is looking right at her wincing face, and he just kind of smiles simply in love with her, oblivious to the fact that his wife is obviously extremely uncomfortable with this whole situation, you know? Um, now, that, that was meant to be seen by the audience, and like, oh, we're, that, that was a cue to us as audience that like, oh, She's uncomfortable right now, but they were making it so obvious in the scene that the husband should have been able to see that as well. There are ways to pull that off. There are shots you, I mean, for one thing, you don't put the, the husband looking at the wincing woman in the same shot. You go really in close on her eyes so, and allow the actor to do something very subtle so that you can believe that the husband would miss it, that she's wincing, you know? But when you keep the shot out like that and she's wincing, you know, so so that we can see it, but, you know, her husband's looking right at it, it just it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So there are ways that you can make these kinds of things, you can make subtext communicate a lot and still work logically within the scene as it's taking place, but uh, they, they, they didn't do that here, and they tend not to do that in these sub CW shows. Um, so I, I suspect it's a production level issue. I, I don't know, um, but since it happens in all of these CW shows, I think it must be something on the foundational production level, some philosophy of how, they're, uh, how they produce these shows, the style that they're going for. It's something wrapped up in that um, that results in this, what seems to me to be an overly simplistic artificiality in how characters come across in all of these CW DC Comics shows. I also really struggled with Alice, the villain, the arch nemesis of Batwoman. She came across to me as especially one-dimensional in her insanity. Unfortunately, the end of the premiere makes it very clear that we're going to be seeing a lot more of Alice. She is inextricably connected to Kate Kane's long-term story, and that couldn't have been made more clear than it was at the end of the pilot. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's going to be not just the big bad of this season, she's probably going to be sticking around the whole series as a major player in this story. <sighs> Hopefully she will uh, be allowed to modify her performance in some way that will, well, I, I, I don't care, I'm not going to be watching it. So. <laughs> all right, well, uh, stunts and visuals, the costumes and makeup all have the same slightly stylized look of all CW shows. You know, everyone has just a little too much makeup on their face and their, or, or they're, they're a little too much product in their hair to come across as, you know, people, normal people rather than models. You know, has something to do with the lighting and the makeup and the, 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 the costumes. Everyone looks just a little bit too GQ, you know, just a little too photo shoot ready. <laughs> You know, uh, the action effects uh, are fine, and they're what you would expect from a CW superhero show. All right, so as far as themes 
uh, any themes that deal with moral, philosophical, spiritual issues that might trigger some worthwhile thought or conversation? I think so. Um, it, it may be that an invest that investment in the motivation of the character, you know, connection with the character's motivation in this, requires an audience who wants Kate Kane to have a homosexual relationship. We are clearly meant to sympathize with her when her chance for that kind of relationship falls apart. But as a Bible-believing Christian, I don't view human sexuality in a way that will make me uh, want anyone to have a homosexual relationship. You know, I can mourn when people feel unloved, and I can mourn when they feel like they don't fit in anywhere. I can have compassion for people in that situation. But I can't get myself to a place where I'm rooting for someone to pursue and successfully find a long-lasting homosexual romance. And so there are things that the filmmakers are counting on me feeling that I'm just not going to feel. And I think that that uh, reduces the effectiveness of their product for uh, a, a lot of people in their potential audience. Um, the final word in the episode um, from Kate Kane, as she's kind of summing up writing a journal entry to Bruce Wayne that he'll hopefully read someday if he ever becomes not missing. Um, she says, I was running toward everything that didn't want me. I spent 15 years searching for a place I fit, and I think I finally found it. And referring to uh, the mantle of the bat that she's now taking up, she says, some see fear, others see hope. I see the freedom to be myself, to play by my own rules. So that's kind of like the big deal. That's what being Batwoman means to her, is fitting in, playing by her own rules, and having the freedom to be herself. It really doesn't seem to be about pursuing justice. It seems to be like, oh my gosh, this, I can finally fit in, play by my own rules, and uh, be myself, you know. But um, even aside from that as being like a, you know, a, I don't know, not, not a really great, like, uh, resounding uh, idea that, that I can connect with, you know. I mean, I think it's much more noble to want to seek out justice for those who are victims, you know. Um, but even setting that aside, I don't see freedom for her in this scenario. She's only wearing a, a mask. And she's, she can only be herself and play by her own rules and fit in when she's wearing a mask and no one knows who she really is. I wonder if the writers even realize that. Um, that she seems to be, I mean, the, the way the music was swelling and stuff, I, I think that we're meant to feel like, yes, this is good. She's finally, this will be her source of freedom, and we're supposed to feel that along with her. Whether the writers realize it or not, I, I don't see freedom in that. Maybe they will realize that, maybe they already do, and they're going to take her in a direction where she will realize, oh, I'm not really playing by my own rules, I'm not really fitting in, I'm not really being myself, because I'm wearing a mask and no one else knows who I am. <laughs> you know, so, um, real freedom comes when we are truly known and accepted. Not merely by people, although that can make a huge difference in our lives, um, but people's judgments of us, their opinions of us and the world, those are all flawed things. Things. Um, but no, freedom, real freedom comes from truly being known and accepted by our creator, by our maker, loved unconditionally by him and receiving that love um, and, uh, and, and knowing that we were made for a purpose and that he uh, values us greatly and wants to bring us more and more into the purpose that he made us for. That's, that's where freedom comes. That's where fulfillment comes, you know, um, not in the kind of conjured uh, meaning of life that we try to provide for ourselves or we hope other people will affirm in us, you know. So the, the, the value system and the messaging of this pilot are really an unfocused mess to me as I try to sort through it all. Um, and I think that's just one more reason that I, I don't plan to give this show any more of my time. Now, I have no idea what your tastes are in television shows, but if I were a time traveler, I'd go back in time and say, Pater, skip, skip. I know you're thinking maybe this time, but no, you know. Play some more Ghost Recon Breakpoint or take a nap. You're in the middle of a cold that's sucking all the energy out of you, so just... Just uh, skip this one. <laughs> it doesn't have an MPAA rating, of course, but I would say it's maybe PG-13-ish for sexual issues that parents will want to consider before letting their kids watch, um, and for non-bloody rock'em, suck'em action. Uh, those are my thoughts. I'd love to get yours in the comments below. Please like, share, subscribe, click that notification bell. Anything you want to do to stay connected to this content or share it with others, uh, I would really appreciate. I want to thank the Spirit Blade Insiders for making this and all of my content possible. You can get more information about the benefits of joining at patreon.com slash spiritbladeproductions and then I hope you'll join us soon over at christiangeekcentral.com as we continue to geek out and seek the truth.
Hey, Peter Franson here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. For my sixth consecutive year, I'm participating in Extra Life, a charity event that raises funds to provide medical care for children in urgent need. I'm also leading the Christian Geek Central Extra Life team, which you're still welcome to join by following the link in the description below. Once again this year, I'm drawing attention to our team's fundraising by performing a 24-hour marathon of video gaming that I will stream live on YouTube.com slash ChristianGeekCentral and ChristianGeekCentral.com beginning 6 a.m. Pacific Time on Saturday, November 2nd. You can donate on my page or on any team member's page by following the links below where you will also find incentives and rewards for doing so. For example, on my page, for $5 or more, you can choose a topic to add to my plus three page of many topics that I'll be blabbing my opinions on during the live stream. For $10 or more, you get the previous reward and a download code for a free copy of the Spirit Blade special special edition audio drama. For $20 or more, you get the previous rewards and you can choose a game for me to play during my November 2nd live stream. Pick a favorite or torture me with something terrible or rage-inducingly difficult. For $30 or more, you get the previous rewards and you can choose a song for me to sing during my November 2nd live stream. Pick an old favorite of yours or just make me humiliate and torture myself with something no one wants to hear. And for $50 or more, you get all the previous rewards and a download code for every MP3 product at spiritblade.com. That's an $80 value. On top of that, I've set fundraising milestones that will unlock strange and unusual happenings as I reach them. At $200, I'll have a free download day for everyone who visits spiritblade.com on November 6th. And as my total goes beyond $200, I'll unlock increasingly more content for that free download day. I will also let my boys tickle me for one minute straight during my November 2nd live stream. And depending on how far beyond $200 my fundraising goes, I will cover my face in peanut butter and jelly while talking about horror movies, put on a frozen solid t-shirt the morning of my live stream while playing video of me singing soothing classical music at my senior recital in college, shoot water up my nose with a turkey baster, get my wife Holly to play a game with me for 30 minutes of the live stream, or the grand daddy of all milestones squirm intensely mortified while showing an embarrassing video clip from the original stage version of Spirit Blade. Now there are some stipulations and time limits on those rewards and milestones so quickly follow the link below to my fundraising page for all the details. I hope you'll be a part of helping me and the Christian Geek Central team do some good for some kids uh, who really need it. And then please join me at uh, youtube.com slash Christian Geek Central for my 24-hour marathon starting at 6 a.m. Pacific on Saturday, November 2nd. Hope to see you there.